last weekend I gave a similar talk at Maple, um, and we'd structured it with uh, we the talk, and then we'll sit, and then Q and A, and then another short sit at the end. I kind of like that, uh, just to let go of things again at the end. Um, so if we want to do a little discussion. Doing any now, uh, if that makes sense. And curious to hear your responses to the talk or the meditation. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Mm. Uh, the themes are ever present in my practice. Um, the way my mind, I want to ask you a question. How do you translate Ishwara Pramadana? You said surrender, but oh. can you go a little bit more into Ishwara, for example? Yeah. yeah. How do you translate what yeah. is that for you? Yeah. Um, well, I think it, uh, you know, if you're talking about Ishvara, it depends on the audience um, in a certain way because people in American culture have very particular images that come to their mind when they think about God. And that's generally not at all what is being referred to in yoga in my experience um, so tend to be careful <laughs> um, try to be a little bit careful with how you use that word uh, but the way I'm familiar with the term Ishvara is as uh, Well, it's interesting. There's different words for God depending on the use in yoga or in Hindu philosophy generally. And so often I've heard of like Brahma is used in philosophical discussions about God as the, the, the everything. Um, Ishvara I've, is often used in practice as the object of surrender, the object of devotion, um, in my understanding. So, Ishvara is um, the, the Godhead to which a person works to perceive, works to surrender to. Um, and that's relatively fluid uh, in that, you know, between various traditions in India, like some people might see that as Krishna, or some people might see that as Shiva, or some people might see that as Kali, or, you know, there's many... Do you know who Patanjali Ishvara was? Uh, or is? In the... I know in the um, specific tradition that I'm familiar with, like my teacher, it goes through the Shaiva. Um, I, don't, I don't know very much about Patanjali himself. Do you know? Uh, generally, people feel that it's most likely Shiva, but yeah. there's not absolute certainty because yeah. it wasn't directly said. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That, that's a okay. Uh, can I say that for me, my confession to you, as a grateful practitioner who's sharing is. <laughs> uh, in this dialogue, like last week, uh, I brought up the relation between Dharma and Dhyan. Oh. Because generally in the Buddhist thought, it's focused, as you've mentioned, on concentration, yeah. Dharma. Yeah. And then in the Sangha, that's preparatory to Dhyan. Mm. And what the subtle difference is, is very important for most people who are absorbed in the meditative aspect. Mm. Uh, so mm. 
the general talk is that you still haven't, uh, when you're concentrating, learning concentration, yeah. single pointedness is the basic idea that we have many priorities and focuses mm -hmm. that keep us from being one pointed. Mm -hmm. And that if you can attain concentration, then if you'll be able to enter beyond or actual meditation, mm -hmm. which is meant to be like it's in the Western world it is actual meditation is like revelation. Mm -hmm. In other words, you start to perceive the actual Atman, the actual self. Mm -hmm. And then Samadhi seals the deal. Mm -hmm. You are the self. So you're meditating on first that which helps you concentrate. Yeah. And what's very, very important in most traditions is that there's a recognition that, like in Buddhism, the individual struggling for their own authenticity and self-realization is the foundation, Hinayana. Mm. Then after some work with that, the recognition is there that there's a great vehicle that is bigger than my own enlightenment. And that it has this whole culture of bodhisattvas. And, uh, it's a group soul experience, if there is soul. <laughs> but it's mm -hmm. basically group. The Dharma and yeah. the Sangha become huge. Mm -hmm. And you can enter into that. And then there's Vajradhan. So this is a gradual mounting up of in Vajrayana, he can transmit that self-realization radically with any individual. And uh, this appears to be, uh, Zen has some quality of that in mm -hmm. Buddhist yeah. uh, mm -hmm. culture. But you mentioned briefly bhakti. Yeah. And uh, that's what I'm most part of mm -hmm. after being eclectic and uh, <coughs> going through my process of Ishwara Pranada, basically. Yeah. Who, so that you mentioned bhakti, but you mentioned it in a way that is an insult to my lineage. Oh. And I want you to know it. Yeah. Uh, because I know you don't intend it. Huh. But if in, uh, if somebody basic idea is if you use the devotion for your own enlightenment oh. that is I'm going to be devoted to you so I can get my flow going because I need to be mm. and then when I attain enlightenment oh. see late I'm, I'm you know I'm as good as you are <laughs> or better maybe <laughs> so this this is going on in many levels that in the modern dispensing mm -hmm. gift from India, yoga, there's a lot of that, like Ramakrishna mission, allows that understanding of bhakti. But in my lineage, that's considered an insult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because also the other point that I think is really important what you're saying about goal orientation, yeah. and how you experience the Buddhist, one part of Buddhism as you get enough merit, then you get enlightenment. <laughs> it's like, like, you know, cause and yeah. effect. And there, there's a, that's a kind of naive, <laughs> I think, in general. Um, but, so you get very subtle about that in regard mm -hmm. to like uh, Nagarjuna or somebody yeah. who's really refining. How does it actually, why do some people take so long on this path and others, boom. Mm -hmm. And what it, what's the real evidence of full awakening? All of these things are still uh, culturally alive. Mm. So, uh, but what I want to say is uh, generally the tapas seems to be developing consistent witness. Mm. And in order to do that, you need to have rhythm in all of your relations. And that generally, 
tamas is considered inertia. Mm -hmm. These are common definitions of the gunas. And, uh, and rajas is directional movement. Mm -hmm. But it's not spherical. It's not rhythmical. So that's the danger which you keep pointing out of people who try to, yeah. by their own willpower, they jump on the Hinayana lotus and they're going to make it happen. Because <laughs> they heard that you sit on that like Buddha and you don't get up mm. until you're enlightened. Mm. Mara can come whoever. I'm with and that kind of willfulness is naive. Mm. But it's precious. <laughs> it's very, very precious. Yeah. Because it, it develops the humor, the pun, it develops the heat of tapasya in a real experiential way. Because you're fighting against yourself, your own ignorance. Mm. And when you start really getting intense about that, you see how vast the ignorance is. Mm. Hopefully. <laughs> and then you get a sense of sattva, oh, like you're guiding us. Ease off a little bit, you know. You might think the fastest way to write is just muscle through. Mm -hmm. But that's nonsense. And it creates very dangerous uh, novitiates. Yeah. Even black lords, they say, you know, dark lords. Because you get so strong with your own will and then why, why not play God? You can do it in the East easy. Get your ashram going. You're God, you're Guru to many people. So it's very dangerous, potential. So there's supposed to be very serious checks and balances mm -hmm. in these kind of Mahayana vehicles or yeah. group. Uh, so that no uh, rational animal can reflect and act at the same time. Mm. They can't do it. But the enlightened being is that. <laughs> they don't have to think. They are what they are. <laughs> and they are showing everybody you can be transcendental too and transpersonal. Mm. But you can't do it by making, you can't make it happen any more than you can stop it. It's like taking birth. And that's what Jesus said, you know, unless you become like a child, take birth again. Realize what the first birth was and how crazy that was. And how you're in this asylum now after taking that birth, where you have to try to find out who the hell you are <laughs> or aren't. And uh, so, the Bhakti Yoga is about avatar. Without avatar and honoring avatar as real, you can't make up your Ishwar. Mm. You can't choose out of the pan. I like Ganesh because he's got a nice trunk and I'm into elephants, you know? They're cruel. And the confusion of Hindu because they are hiding their great lineages behind art to see who can, who's paying attention. And we'll really ask, who's the Lord of Ganesh? Who's the Lord of Shiva? Does Shiva have a Lord? Mm. Is he? All of these are, have been boiling in the Indian subcontinent for thousands of years and producing great lineages. But it's confusing to any outsider. And you can get people coming and representing, but it's still, there's a competition going on for authenticity in spiritual lineage. And that we know they're not religiously neurotic like we are in the West. <laughs> they're about experiencing it, direct experience, and they have a huge culture of how to do that with an avatar. Yeah. And in the West we have Jesus. That's our avatar. And there are plenty of bhakti yogis of Jesus who are learning what are the states of consciousness of being either sleepy or semi-awake or fully awake. 
and they have their own languages. And, mm. But uh, I am very, very interested in how we can become one with reality, but not lose our individuality, mm. which is what you spoke out briefly about mm. bhakti, that you didn't quite understand. But I want to make clear to you that bhakti's real lineage is not about uh, using emotions mm. to get somewhere. That would be really sloppy and, and rude to the emotional nature of the human being. So we're not, we can't, we don't want to define bhakti yoga as mm. uh, you choose who you like and then you attain enlightenment by practicing devotion to them. No. Please don't say that. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm very glad you brought it up. Um, it makes me uh, quite curious about um, Patanjali, in a way, because uh, well, I want to reinvestigate the wording in the Yoga Sutras around this particular topic because he he's gives a very clear and very interesting. Uh, description of choosing meditation topic or objects and he basically says mo many objects will work the best object is Ishra and it is the best object for attaining individual liberation is Ishra and so he recommends Om he recommends the mantra Om or um, but the way I've seen it presented and taught just in my own experience is uh, um, sort of that well Ashtanga I've, is a primarily a vehicle for individual awakening it's, it's not the end is not the cultivation of bhakti or surrender. Um, and but Krishna Charya, yeah. a, he's actually a bhakti yogi too. He knows yeah. what that is. Oh, yeah. And he's a master. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, also, you know. and this is my experience from the tradition is that Ashtanga is expressly oriented towards awakening. And I've learned an enormous amount about at least experientially of surrender through it on accident. I didn't know that's what I was learning, um, but it it comes from being with a the teacher. There has to be a natural process of surrender where yeah. you're developing a relation to who you sur who or what you're surrendering to, uh, and that has to go uh, through stages of yeah. adolescence. Naive youth and then adolescent, it has to. Well, but here's, I guess here's what's interesting to me is, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll come to you right after this. Um, oh, I guess I primarily experienced it in terms of student-teacher relationship, like through guru, basically, where I haven't, most of my understanding of, like, um, the role of Ishvara in, in yoga, comes from self-study of the Yoga Sutras and most of my experiential knowledge just comes from teeth, like the relationship with the teacher. So I don't actually know, you know, in some sense what, uh, how that tradition expressly holds this. Um, yeah. I bet you're curious. Oh, I am very curious. Like, I would love to, yeah, uh, get a little bit, you know, it's, it's a life practice. It makes sense that, yeah. you know, we have to accept reality if we want to well, practice any authentic sadhana. Yeah. Truth sets us free. And in that process, we have to go through a, a decentralization of our own individual desires and passions. We have to surre surrender them and that involves 
a getting intimate with the master mm. without that intimacy which Soren calls contact mm. but we call it uh, Shaktipa or yeah. it's the presence of the relation with the guru who's the real who's already realized mm. or at least adept at realization if they're not fully yeah. and that can be tested yogically for their samadhi can they demonstrate a steady samadhi and so all that can be checks and balances are fully open in this in the yeah. open field it's yeah. not like they're hiding or you know it's like Jesus go ahead put your hand in my side <laughs> go ahead hit me you know my anger is there like you know I'm gonna yeah. these people are definitely about uh, become, producing such self-discipline in their disciples that the discipline itself makes them intimate with their inner heart. Mm. And if you can't do that, you float around. But everyone who has a master, who is a master, has a master. Because nobody's God. And anybody who claims to be, they're especially suspect. <laughs> the avatar just does it. They come and they demonstrate real spiritual life on earth you know, what everyone's praying for. But it, it's hidden and revealed according to who's there. You know, it's, it's never uh, accidental. Mm. It's completely, it's love's envelopment and invitation, but it will never break free will. Mm. Everybody's free here to do whatever they want. And until they want what he has to give, he'll keep giving techniques. Mm. But those who are paying attention and practicing techniques, they get to a point where it's got to be more than a technique, I think. Hmm. And that what it is is the presence of the realizer. It catalyzes, it's contagious more than COVID. You know? Otherwise, there won't be maple. There's some adept to it that people are finding in themselves through recognizing in another. Hmm. At least that is going on. Sure, of that yeah. myself. Yeah. But whether somebody's awake in this adepthood, mm. uh, I'd like to, you know, because I need to wake up. For <laughs> 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 goodness sake, uh, I can't keep dallying around with these techniques. Mm. Of course, I will, but you know, yeah. it's like you said. How are you doing your technique? Mm. What what authenticity are you bringing to it? And are you believing that this is mechanical? Mm. that I develop enough merit now I've got a full bank account now how could it be I think that might be the core really of the argument is like uh, or what I was trying to say in a way is like this is not mechanical like it's not a transaction (laughs) you know if you bring a transactional mind to your practice you will be running into that until you stop you know, um, I wanted to. I wanted to get to your question. Or I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot has fallen under the bridge now. Yeah. Oh. Um, so yes, I wanted to move the discussion uh, away from the intellectual uh, and to the uh, experiential, mm. uh, and to also somehow get a sense of where you're coming from because that's interesting. Mm. I'm curious to see how what brought you to the study when you were isolated in that. There was no community support for that and yet you were motivated to do that. Mm. But that aside, um, what I wanted to interject into this uh, evening is that um, I'm coming from a very intense experience um, to this experience, and uh, and I think there's something to be gained at looking at. Mm-hmm. 
So um, I go to the morning uh, meditation and it's talking about really looking or seeing, seeing everything. And at some point I go to the um, uh, domicile and there it, um, I am met with, um, you know, the, the alcoholic drinking, smoking, a set that uh, has recently become louder uh, and uh, more boisterous um, uh, so that, you know, before, just before sitting here, I am met with a very loud, fuck, 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 and, you know, all kinds of misogynistic references and uh, uh, very loud that you can't escape. And then to come and to be in this environment and to go to this place um, having gone through the uh, yoga teacher training and studying the limbs and etc. etc. and being reminded of that and, uh, and recognizing that this element that I just described, uh, which I'm doing, I'm kind of bringing this element into the room. Mm. Because I think there's a, if I was to live in an ashram, which I considered, um, I would forget. Mm. I would forget that uh, uh, a significant percentage of humanity is living with those thoughts and that um, and that response and uh, um, these are these people by the way are quite lovable yeah, like they're just characters mm -hmm. you know you'd meet them on the street you know, hi yeah. It just happens to be uh, an element of, of uh, whatever is a response to the karmic uh, history of humanity. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring that into the room. Um, I don't know how much time we have now to, but. Uh, uh, Maybe we can respond in, mm. in some fashion, or we could all somehow be with that. And mm. and I guess my point, really, coming to the bo uh, bottom line, is while you were talking about this, I was following all of it, and this guy was in the room, you know, mm. fuck, 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 the whole time, you know, and uh, I was like, oh. That's interesting. Okay. So, you know, it's like you can approach the whole thing individually. Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to um, ascend or be, you know, go move above that, you know, mm. somehow, you know, can we, can we live up here, can we do that? Well, there's something that's missing in an intellectual discussion. Three points I took. There was um, some curiosity about my background, how I 
decided to practice at all. Um, and then there's this inquiry of how to be with the suffering of the world, with uh, and then the last point about the intellectual discussion feels to me like you're actually asking for something, which I think is like heart or, you know. Yeah, like a balance between yeah. the intellectual and something a little more experiential. That, yeah. yeah. And also to add, you know, if, I guess what I'm saying is that it's not an individual thing. Yeah. You know, if this, if these guys are there, you know, I, I mean, I did a journey and, I, and what I got was, oh, you've got to love them. Mm. How do you do that? You know, and, uh, um, and not forget, you can't just forget them. Mm. Yeah. I think it's something like, hmm. well, maybe I can weave these this together into one answer, because I think I can. Um, oh. Which is, I, well, firstly I had a, basically a uh, awakening experience when I was 18, right after I began college, that uh, it was very clear that I would have to practice in a way, or it would be extremely uncomfortable. It, it was like a, um, a, a kundalini event, essentially, that, uh, yeah, there, it, 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 with, with events like that, my experience is that um, you just have to do whatever's necessary to ground and stabilize, mm -hmm. um, or it will be very uncomfortable. Uh, and so I met a teacher through my dad, who was the teacher I was working with in, in Michigan, who was an Ashtanga teacher, um, and I studied deeply in, in that tradition and in uh, Buddhist sort of meditation with Shinzanya. Um, mm -hmm. So I studied with her, I've been studying with her for five years. I am often not physically there, and so I do my own practice and I go touching. But um, yoga was very, very, it's the perfect thing for somebody in like a spiritual crisis because it grounds and clarifies without. Uh, you know, sometimes meditation can destabilize a little bit, like it's a little too much. So it was really, really, really good for me to come to that, and, and to practice that way at that mm -hmm. time. And, um, yeah, I practiced through college because I had to, you know, basically. Um, I, you know, you get enough, uh, to me, it felt like the my whole system was moving that direction so strongly mm -hmm. that doing anything else was extremely, extremely uncomfortable, like painful or I'd have panic attacks. Or it was like it, my body is awakening; I have to do it. Um, so that's the the real answer of like why did I practice in college? It's an insane thing to do um, to try to practice. Uh, I, like the way I did in an academic environment I wouldn't tell other people to do it um, but yeah and so but the real you know part of my my experience was I went into I went in and met with this teacher for the first time when I was 18 in the middle of this experience and um, <coughs> Is something like coming into contact with her. Uh, I felt something that I had never experienced before, um, which like meeting an awakened person essentially was like, well, this is the only thing I want. <laughs> this is the thing that 
I want to do. And in knowing her and over time knowing her, I also saw that people in positions like that, as in being the stewards of communities, of helping many, many other people go through this kind of deep healing work, do more service for humanity than basically anybody else I've met. Mm. Um, like, one who's done that degree of training can hold space for the process of an entire community. Mm. Of, you know, she has 60 students. She's one person in an mm. other works with 50 people, many more people in an extended network. And many of those people are like doctors or, in, or therapists or do some kind of service work in the community. And so she's grounding the nervous systems of like half of the service people in Ann Arbor, you know. It's like behind the scenes, so it's not, it's not the kind of service that you see in the news, mm -hmm. you know. It's not like a big non-profit initiative or something. It's not a protest, mm -hmm. but my sense is... Um, that there's a very uh, strong relationship with depth of practice mm -hmm. and the ability to do good. Um, very, very strong. And there's another example of like, I lived at this you know, little Zen temple in Ann Arbor for eight months and the abbess there is, um, she's basically one person who, who has built this community um, is like a grandmother to half of Ann Arbor, you know. She has been there for 40 years and just put so much love into one place. Mm -hmm. And I think the only that I really admire, in a way, is like, that is the most beneficial thing I could imagine doing in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and the people I know who have done that often devote themselves mindedly to awakening for a period of time. And that might mean not being of service in other ways in that time. Mm -hmm. Like, so you went to, to train for six years, ten years in Japan and Asia, and mm -hmm. what he's doing now would not be possible without that. Mm -hmm. And so it does mean that single-minded focus can be good. It also means you should be using it appropriately. Like, know that that's what you're doing if you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're turning away from the world to awaken, that's a decision with its own karmic consequences. And if you're just kind of messing around and you're not serious, like, that has its own consequence. Um, and mm -hmm. I think we're, we're invited into that recollection living at Maple in various ways, basically. So he tries to remind us that, you know, People are dying. Um, this is not a joke. It's not a game. Uh, and and there are stakes. Uh, and so, yeah, I I think that that's the answer. Is that uh, I started practice because I had to, and now. It's more like the people that I've met in my life who are doing the most uh, do this fully. They go as deeply as they possibly can into these traditions. Um, and it doesn't necessarily matter the truth so much as how deeply you surrender into it. Um, so that's my, my understanding relate to those questions for myself. Have we had time? I think so. Well, uh, I would just invite any last, you know, any last response to that? Closing. I think there's more. Mm. That's all. Okay. There's not time. Okay. I could read a little, I could recite a poem. Mm. Well, we'll have, we'll have time. It. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll have time to talk a bit after, but uh, we should close the a little bit of this now. Um, uh, now is usually the point where we share things going on in the local community and we'll put specifically uh, uh, 
activities with the Wikimedia Service? Do any of you have things to share in that end? I will repeat what I said, what I usually say. There's a satsang meditation in the cemetery. If it gets cold or it's rainy, obviously, there's a little gazebo there. If it just drizzles, it might be happening. But that's at 4 o'clock on Fridays. Anybody's welcome to join us. It's a regular thing. Lakeview Cemetery, 4 o'clock Fridays. Down at the bottom, where you can see the lake on the north end corner, lower north corner. Thank you. So we'll end there, and there'll be 10, 15 minutes to chat in that room, and we'll end the night with the chant of compassion. Thank you for joining. I really appreciate what you share. I think like um, uh, I, t- I talked to her at the parents who recently left and she's back when we get home with the parents and like uh, like I I speak to my mother every every week or so and I've heard and I talk to my stepfather uh, some more seldom, but um, I don't have to like live with them. And she she has to like live in the house with her parents. I was like, oh my god, oh my god, that right. is way... Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, uh, I think it's especially, like, it's especially, like, eat. so being in Mabel, of course, I have to, like, see people's stuff, I have to see my own stuff. It's not like people in Mabel are, like, angels or anything, but, like, yeah, right. uh, I don't have to see them blinding themselves to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm, it's very scary when I touch people who are like completely shut off to their own garbage. Right. It's like drowning in it. And I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't look at this. Oh my goodness. No. Mm. Right, that's how I feel too. And I'm forced to look at it. Yeah. And there must be about that that's important. So I'm, you know, saying, okay. <laughs> You know, because there's, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> yeah.